Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Meeting House live stream. My name is Carmen. I'm the senior pastor here at the Meeting House. And wherever you are and whoever you are, I just want to say a big welcome. Welcome to church. You may be, I'm try, I was actually trying to take an inventory as we do this online church thing of who we are as we make up live stream time together. And I was just trying to think of a few categories and I think maybe I will have found one, one that captures you. And if I haven't, let me know because there's always that one that I forget about. But I think you might be someone who is just like a longtime meeting houser and I said, live stream is my church. In this season of my life, this is how and where and when I do church. We're glad that you are here. Maybe you're someone who calls the meeting house home and you usually attend a local parish and you're not this morning for whatever reason and we have this fantastic luxury of still being church together even when you're at home engaging with the live stream. Perhaps you're one of our distance church members, someone who doesn't actually live in the physical locality of where the meeting house exists, but you certainly are still engaged and would call this church home. Maybe you're part, one of, part of one of our distance home churches or you engage with the live stream form wherever you find yourself across the world. Or maybe you're just someone who's brand new and either accidentally or on purpose stumbled across our live stream today. And for wherever you find yourself, I feel like that captures everyone. That last category I feel like was pretty much a catch-all, but if I haven't captured you, let me know in the chat. Just want to say that to say we're doing church together in this way. We are glad that you're here. And even though we're scattered wherever we find ourselves, there's an opportunity to connect and to engage in what God might have for us as the meeting house this morning. And so I'm really glad that you're here. If you are one of those newer people and you want to know more about us as a church, us as a community, the best way to do that is to head to themeetinghouse.com slash connect. Ask your questions. Find out information. We want to make sure that you feel like this is a space that you can feel comfortable and call home. Also, another fantastic way to connect, there's a few. One of them is to hang out in the chat this morning. If you're watching this live time, real time, we have a fantastic chat going on. Say hello, start to connect with the people that are engaged in our chat. We wanna make sure that this feels like an experience that we're doing together. Or maybe you're hanging out on Discord. This is something we've been trying to like shout out and highlight because we have a fantastic community that connects on Discord. If that's you, shout out to you. We're glad that you're with us. You can see the link there if that's something you wanna hop on or join in with in all of the ways we get to do church. And church is this incredible community where we get to be together in all kinds of ways, but also more importantly, just look to what God might have for us and might have for you today. So welcome, we're glad that you are here. And it's September, we made it. We crossed that line from the last kind of summer month, even though September is summer, into this month that holds so many new rhythms for us. And even though there still are a few weeks left of officially of summer, uh, we're, we've sort of turned that page into this month that holds the beginnings of all the things, doesn't it? September is almost like the new January in a sense. There's so many new starts. The agenda starts to fill up a little more. We start to uh, figure out what we're gonna participate in, in our lives, in our families, in our church, in our community, and September holds all of that. But before we rush too quickly to that, I wanna invite us to do something together this morning. We have a practice in our family that our kids taught us actually a bunch of years ago called Roses and Thorns. Do you do something like that? Do you know what I'm talking about? We call it roses and thorns. You might have a different name for it, but every night around the dinner table, we uh, get people to say their rose and their thorn, which really just represents their high and their low from the day. And it is pretty fantastic to get a sense of what a five-year-old or a seven-year-old or a 10-year-old might consider a rose and a thorn. Uh, and I wanna ask you that question. As you pause and we turn the page away from summer a little bit, what would your rose and your thorn be from your summer? As you take inventory of the last weeks and the last months, I hope they've held for you a pace and a rhythm that has included rest and relaxation and rejuvenation. But what would you say maybe your highlights have been? Where have, where have you had an experience that is just like life-giving or soul-filling or just made you laugh or connected with people you haven't seen in a while? And on the other side, what would your thorn be? What were some of maybe the lows of the last weeks and months? Where has there been hardship or unexpected disappointment or times that just felt more challenging? And then my third question is, regardless of your highs or your lows, where have you seen God in the midst of it all? Where has he been present for you? And if paying attention to the presence of God is a new practice for you, let me just encourage you and remind you that he is very much present in the highs and in the lows. And sometimes we just have to pay attention a little bit to figure out where he is. So I want to invite us to just take a moment and think about that 
knowing that we're kind of in the straddling weekend, aren't we? Here, here where the Meeting House exists here in Ontario, it's a long weekend. I know it is across Canada. It's, uh, it's this weekend where we straddle, we hold on to summer, but we're about to hop into the new rhythms that the fall would hold. And as we do that, I invite you to say, where has God been present for me in these summer months? As we continue to connect this morning, I want to invite you this morning, we're going to try something a little different. At the end of our time together, we are going to connect with Samuel Sarpia. Samuel's our discipleship pastor, and he's teaching this morning. He is our teacher, and so you'll be hearing from him in a few minutes as we head into a time of teaching. And then him and I are just going to chat a little bit more, and we're going to do some follow-up with him. This is the fun part about getting to do live stream church together, is asking him some questions out of the teaching, getting to know him a little better. And this is where I do want you to make use of the chat. If you have questions for Samuel, throw them in there, and we're going to try to capture a few of those as we engage with him following the teaching time today. As we talk just about new rhythms as we head into a new month, as you are probably doing the inventory of what September and the months ahead are going to look like for you, I want you to consider as we talk a little bit about rhythms of life at the church, what does that look like for you? What are you considering or figuring out or sensing God saying to you about what it looks like to make church a part of the rhythm of your fall and of this year ahead? What does it look like to continue to call the meeting house home? What is God potentially inviting you into to engage with and connect with and dig a little deeper into the community here at the meeting house? We're walking a really difficult season and yet I think God has some significant things to say to us about drawing close together as community and leaning in together. And part of that is giving. And we take a minute every Sunday to just do a bit of a giving moment to say this is a portion of who we are as community too. To say that as we do life together, as we do church life together, part of how we accomplish that is by your giving. By all of us saying, if this is the place I call home, if this is the community I lean into, I give a portion of what God has provided me with for the work of the church. And so many of you give so faithfully and we say thank you for that. And as you consider your rhythms and your, your life for the fall, if the meeting house is a part of that, if this community is a part of that, consider what that rhythm of giving looks like for you too. If you have questions about giving and wanna know more, you can see the link there. There's some, there's some information about how to give and also just some information about what the idea is behind giving and how it's actually a posture of worship for us, for those of us that call the meeting house home and for those of us that follow Jesus. We're gonna continue into worship through a time of musical worship now. And before we do that, I wanna say a prayer, a specific prayer actually, as we talk about rhythms in September and new chapters being written. For those of us here in Ontario, for those of us here in Canada, this is that weekend where children, all the kids, all of our students are turning the chapter into heading back to school. And so the prayer I wanna pray, I'd love for us to kind of posture our hearts and pray it all together is for our kids, for our students, knowing that significantly this is a time of year where there's a bit of a new rhythm starting for them too. And with that can come such excitement. Our house is like bouncing off the walls with excitement, but then also maybe some trepidation, some uncertainty, new days lay ahead for everyone. And so I wanna pray a prayer. It's not my words. These are the words of Sarah Bessie. We've adapted it a little bit. She's a fantastic writer and author and speaker. And she's got this beautiful prayer as we send our kids, our students back into the world. So let's pray this together. And then we're gonna head into a time of worship through singing. Let's do this, let's pray. As we head back into our classrooms, whatever they may look like, we pray for our students that you step into the fall completely sure that you are loved and that you belong. May your roots grow down deep into God's soil so that you will bear the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May you know that God is with you and for you always. And it is good for you to be fully yourself as God created you to be. We pray that you would sow seeds of life and hope wherever you find yourself, helping peace to grow. May your minds be clear and engaged, your memories sharp, and your wisdom beyond your years. May you ask for what you need without feeling fear or feeling shame. May you be safe, beloved children, protected from anything that seeks to harm in any measure. When you are afraid, may you feel our love wrapped around you and take heart. May you do what is right and good and kind and just, no matter what everyone else might do. We pray that you would be a blessing to your teachers and the school staff, and we pray that they, in turn, would see and affirm in you the fullness God has created. 
We pray for good friendships that will sharpen and delight you. And we pray that you would have eyes to see the lonely ones who need a friend. May you have many opportunities to practice being both brave and kind. Beloved students of God, we send you out in the knowledge that God is before, behind, and with you always. May you know his love and his purpose richly with each new day. Amen. In that posture and in just a posture of ex expectation, let's head into the rest of our worship and teaching time together. Hello and welcome. We are going to spend some time in musical worship, so feel free to stand and join us or sit and reflect however you feel this morning. The time is yours. This is your time with God. So spend it however you want. Jesus. 
extravagant It doesn't make sense We'll never comprehend The way you love us It's unthinkable Only heaven knows Just how far you'd go To say First Peter 2.29 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. We are chosen. We are given the gift of love, the gift of freedom from our failures, from our mistakes, and we're given the gift of relationship with God himself. We were created to praise him. And so let's do that with this next song. Let's, let's honor him with our worship.
point of reference you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light and as you speak a hundred billion galaxies are
Hope is not optimism. It's the resolve to live within the promises we have made, trusting in surprise. Stanley Hauerwas. To be a Christian is to live dangerously, honestly, freely. To step in the name of love as if you may land on nothing, yet to keep on stepping because the something that sustains you, no empire can give you and no empire can take away. Cornell West, Democracy Matters. By judging others, we blind ourselves to our own evil and to the grace which others are just as entitled to as we are. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship. There's another reason why you should love your enemies, and that is because hate distorts the personality of the hater. We usually think of what hate does for the individual hated, or the individuals hated, or the groups hated. But it is even more tragic. It is even more ruinous and injurious to the individual who hates. You just begin hating somebody, and you will begin to do irrational things. You can't see straight when you hate. You can't walk straight when you hate. You can't stand upright. Your vision is distorted. Martin Luther King Jr. Loving Your Enemies November 17th, 1957 If any man would come after me, let him deny himself. The disciple must say to himself the same words Peter said of Christ when he denied him. I know not this man. Self-denial is never just a series of isolated acts of mortification or asceticism. It is not suicide, for there is an element of self-will even in that. To deny oneself is to be aware only of Christ and no more of self. To see only him who goes before and no more the road which is too hard for us. Once more, all that self-denial can say is, He leads the way, keep close to Him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus. Matthew chapter 5 verses 43 to 48. Yes, so good morning and welcome to our parishes, our communities, our regions that are joining us and our live stream that are joining us and you here get the first hand account here in Oakville. Uh, we're wrapping up our last week of our God Only Knows series, and uh, I can't think of a better person than my dear brother Samuel to take us home to end in the last week for our series. And um, I'm looking forward to this, And but before we get into it, I just want to give a quick heads up on what we've got uh, for the next series coming up. It's an opportunity as we get into our uh, month of September where new rhythms or maybe old rhythms kind of get back into, uh, into practice that we as a, as a church at the Meeting House want to go back to some of the things that make us distinctively Anabaptist. So we want to spend some time recentering our teaching around the Anabaptist tradition of a Jesus-centric theology. This idea, you hear this a lot, we talk about being Jesus-centered. So we want to spend the next, uh, after this week, the next four weeks, where Carmen, Jimmy, and myself will be able to, uh, to share a little bit more on what it is. And, and uh, hopefully the goal is to get a little bit of grounding of uh, who we are and, uh, and where we're headed as we become more uh, Jesus-centered in our teaching and our time. But before that, 
we get to see my dear brother Samuel, who's going to be sharing with us. And I'm looking forward to this. Samuel and I had an opportunity. Sam, for those of you who don't know, Samuel is our new uh, discipleship pastor for all of our uh, communities throughout the entire uh, meeting house. And um, is a gift to have been able to get to know. Uh, we got to have coffee earlier uh, when he first came on staff. And he doesn't know this, but after our first coffee, I said, we need to have more coffee because I'm going to spend as much time as I can with this man and glean as much wisdom and understanding, uh, particularly around areas of peace and reconciliation. He's uh, someone that um, uh, has done an incredible amount of work uh, across the globe in uh, building reconciliation and bridges in healing. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from you and for you being able to teach us. And, uh, and also, we got to spend, I think you're going to talk about this. Talk but a little bit about it. Yeah. <laughs> the last two weeks, we just came back from a, a learning trip with uh, MCC at, uh, in Timmins. And uh, we got to be, not only experience that with our First Nation uh, brothers and sisters up north in Timmins, but we got to be roommates for a week. Yeah. And um, so now I think I have stories to last, like, the next, like, 10 years, I think. <laughs> when you said this, <laughs> spend some time with somebody with that level of intimacy. But we'll... We'll save that for we'll another save day. That for another yeah. Day. Can we do that? Yeah. Maybe let's do that. <laughs> so What's we don't start it right here. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. okay. Maybe we'll, we'll postpone. Okay. Much love to you, brother. Thank you. Blessings. Yeah. Uh, good morning, brothers and sisters. Oh, thank. You. Yeah. Finally, I think I was thinking that maybe everybody's sleeping after Quincy's just gone on and on and on and on and on. I don't know what I've just done. I've started, I'm, I'm starting on a wrong footing here. I'm starting on a wrong footing because now the next time Quincy comes up the stage, he will give you all the secrets that the one week in the same room will be spent talking about me. God forgive me. Uh, my name is Samuel Sarpia. I am the discipleship pastor for the meeting house. The joy of being the discipleship pastor at, this, at the meeting house is it gives me the length and breadth of the width and the width of our church. I get to know what is happening in every single region of our church. And not only get to know what is happening in every single region, but I get to participate in seeing the, the different discipleship pathways that we have in the church. And I know some of you might be asking, what is discipleship pathways? Is there a roadmap somewhere that we can follow? Yes, there is a discipleship pathways happening in our church. We have the children's church, the youth and young adults, the compassion, and the home church, and the many others that are happening informally. Those are the discipleship pathways. And so when you get a discipleship pastor to preach, what, was, what, what is he going to preach about? About discipleship. So the title of my sermon this morning is Living as Radical Disciples. And it is taken from the Sermon on the Mount of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. But before I get into it, let us pray. God, we thank you that we can call ourselves children of the Most High God. That we can call ourselves, that we know that we are on a journey, and on this journey it is with you, and you are the leader, you are the great shepherd that shepherds us through this journey. Although in this journey we may stumble and fall, but you, O oh God, picks us up and say, you can do it. Give us the ears and the heart and, the, and quicken our spirit to respond as you speak to us today and in the days ahead. Thank you because we ask all this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And for those of you that have watched last week's sermon that was preached for the online uh, audience, I am so glad that Jimmy kicked us off on discipleship for dummies. I remember back in the day when you could walk into a bookstore and buy a book like Microsoft for Dummies, Apple for Dummies, you name it. And there's even one that says Christianity for Dummies. Can you believe it? I wonder what the, what the content of that is. I actually am trying to lay my hands on it. As I, as I prepare my sermon, I realize that there's a Christianity for dummies, so I've actually ordered it just so I can see what does that really mean? And is, what, is, what does Christianity mean for dummies? 
So, but continuing on the theme of discipleship, I will take this up a little bit, take it up a notch a little bit from where Jimmy started last week. And I'll take it up because I will come back to the passage where Jesus was preaching on the Sermon on the Mount. But before I get there, bear this in mind that Jesus called his disciples in Matthew 11 from verse 28 to 30. He calls you and I by saying, Come, follow me. I cannot read on this screen because it will look like I'm turning away from the camera for those that are watching online. So I'll read on my text here. It says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So this is an invitation that Jesus invites you and I to come on this journey of discipleship. He began by, when he invites his disciples, the invitation is still an invitation that is out there to you and I and to everyone. And this invitation invites us into what we call a movement. And this movement is done when you come to Jesus, when you get yoked with Jesus. And for those of you who are wondering, what is yoke? Yoke is simply the beam that traditionally in ancient Palestine that connects that yoke to uh, horses or two cows together to plow the ground. And so Jesus is saying, take my yoke because it is light and easy. Jesus is saying, come on, my friends, if you hang out with me, if you Dwell in my presence. If you just hold on to the teachings that I give you, it will be light and easy. And this journey of discipleship will not just be about a bunch of rules, do's, and don'ts, but rather it will be a stepping stone into what God has called us to be. And so in this movement, as we do go, go on this movement with Jesus, we don't only go on this movement with Jesus alone, but we go on this movement with people around us. It is interesting that when you hear people say, I am a follower of Jesus, but I'm all alone doing my own thing. I question that kind of a journey because Jesus calls us into a community. And when I say a question is, I'm not, I'm not saying it's bad in itself. There are times that you will want to be on your own to spend quality time with God. But the, 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 the essence of, Christi- of following Jesus is not me alone, but we do it in community. And so we do this following of Jesus in community because people disciple people. Amen. I'm glad that there's somebody here that's recognizing that, that's doing the Pentecostal thing. When, when Quincy and I went to Timmins, um, they, it, this is not my script. By the way, we arrived Timmins on Monday. By Tuesday, I was a Pentecostal guy. <laughs> By Friday, I was already taking up offerings. So they call me televangelist. They go, you went from, Pente- from you, you arrived Anabaptist, you became Pentecostal, and end up televangelist. And so Jesus calls us. I don't know why I went there, but it, it's out there. So forgive me, yeah, Pente- you Pentecostal lovers there. I, I'm, I have nothing against Pentecostals or tele- televangelists. I will still remain my Anabaptist. So Jesus calls us to do life together. And in doing life together, there is often a visible outcome, a visual outcome. Because when we do life together, my life is transformed, your life is transformed. We are able then to hold each other accountable according to the words of Scripture and according to our understanding of what community is. And all of this... God is with us on this journey. You're not all alone. We're not all alone. I'm not all alone. And so I have been asked by a couple of people, what is discipleship or who is a disciple? A disciple is a student or an apprentice or a follower of a teacher or master. 
While this language may have, been, may, may have lost its meaning in our day and age, but I tell you the word discipleship is about watching closely to the master. It's by following closely to what the teacher is saying. And in this case, it's the word of God and the teachings of Jesus as well as, as we live this out in community. Uh, earlier in the beginning, uh, when, when Quincy introduced himself, me, he talked about he and I going to Timmons. Yet, Quincy and I went to Timmins for a learning tour on, uh, in the indigenous community. But one of the things that I learned about the key to discipleship is I learned something great about discipleship amongst the First Nation people. The First Nation, a couple of people that spoke to us during the week, they came because First Nation communities teach each other orally. And so the disciple and the discipler have to hang around really closely to each other. And so by hanging around closely to each other, they gain the, the knowledge, they gain the heart, they gain the understanding, and they are then able to live out what God, what, what the master has taught them as they translate that to the next generation and the generation after that. A bunch of our teachers were young, most especially one of the young teachers. He's in his 20s. This is like his, he's now beginning to become his own teacher. Everything he said about smudging that he learned from his mentors. Friends, can we as followers of Jesus say, I am working really close to Jesus. And what I'm learning, I am translating it to you. So in today's term, it would be like having a mentor. Because the disciple learned from his master. When the disciple learned from his master, he eventually will one day become a disciple maker. Bonhoeffer described this in his book, In the Cost of Discipleship. He says, costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. And for the sake of it, a man will gladly go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out the eyes which causes him to stumble it is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his net and follow him. Radical discipleship is a call of Christ for which you can sell all that you have to follow him. That the disciples, if we read in the account of the calling of the disciples, when Peter and John and James and all of these young fishermen commit themselves to following Jesus, they left their net, they left everything and follow Jesus. We are called to this kind of a radical life. And I'm not asking you to go out tomorrow after this service and say, I'm quitting my job, I'm now a disciple of Jesus. That's not what I mean. What I mean is, are you willing to let go of everything that you have for the sake of the kingdom? Because the invitation and not just material possession. Are you willing to let go of even your own life? Because Jesus says, come follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And by the way, the essential meaning of the word radical does not, is not, radical in itself comes from the root word radico. And from Latin. And the root word simply says root. The root, not root the name. I know I have an accent, and you guys don't. <laughs> so the, radic, the word radical is simply saying going back to the roots of the teachings of Jesus. So when I speak of radical discipleship, I'm not speak, speaking about some trendy extremism or some, some, some kind of like this, you know, our generation lives and come up with all kind of coin phrases. I'm using the term as a way of reminding us to go back to what is the essence of the teaching of Jesus. Going back to the root of the teaching of Jesus, will, it's not as complicated as we make it out to be. So I define radical discipleship. Uh, radical discipleship expresses the need for a continuous reorientation towards the essential teachings of Jesus. 
and being bound to the root of what he told us, inherent and foundational, fundamental to his lordship. The things that Jesus taught us. Being a radical disciple in this day and age is what we are called to because the fundamental core of our, of, the, of our society is shaken. The fundamental things that we all know as normal is no longer normal. The world, we as followers of Jesus are swimming against the stream and you cannot swim against the stream of the world if you are not truly willing to pay the price of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It is about responding to the call of God, the gracious call of God, which you are called in Christ Jesus. It is about a personal and a public witness. It is personal, but it is a public witness. It is about being the lamp and Jesus being the, being the lampstand and Jesus being the light that shines through the light, through the lampstand. You and I cannot do this on our own. We can only do it by the grace of God. And I believe that the grace of God is sufficient for us today if we can just pause and say, God, where do I need help? Radical discipleship also involves a commitment to prayer, to a prayer life and in a community of accountability. You cannot do radical, you can't claim to be a radical disciple if you do not have a community that you are accountable to. And accountability is key in the kingdom of God. I'm accountable to my colleagues, to you as a church, and we should be accountable to each other. Because the word of God, uh, it's true, rang through, right through the words of the prophet Micah that says, Oh man, he has shown you what is good, what is pleasant, to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Jesus calls us into a deeper journey in a world filled with turmoil. A world filled with brokenness. A world that is polarized, divided by those who have and those who don't. Jesus calls us to demonstrate to the world what it means to be a lampstand as Jesus shines through us. This calls for a radical way of love. It calls for a radical way of sacrifice. And that is why we read in Matthew 5, he says, You have heard it was said, love your enemies. And hate, love your, sorry, you have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your father in heaven because he causes his son to shine on, on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Those are some hard truths here, friends. Love your enemies and pray for them that persecute you. As I reflect on this passage, I began to ask myself, God, are you saying I should love that neighbor that is a, you know, back in the, when I lived in the U.S., it's easy to, to pinpoint and say the Democrat or Republican, right? Uh, God, are you saying I should love liberal or conservative? It is tough. Those conservatives are knucklehead. Or oh, those liberals are just out of control. How can you, God, say I should love somebody that I just absolutely disagree with? Yes, this is what God is saying. He says, love your enemies. The enemy might not be somebody that is way far out there. The enemy might be the guy next door that you absolutely disagree with. The enemy might be somebody that has posted something on social media and it's grinding you up. And you cannot be, you, you can't just hold it. You, you can't control yourself. And Jesus is saying, I shall love them? I believe, or I'm convinced, that when we demonstrate such a love, it will radically change the world. Do you want to see a change in the world? Love your enemies. 
Do you want to see change in the world? Love your enemies. Because if we demonstrate to people that we absolutely disagree with, that we love them, and loving them does not mean we tolerate their behavior. Loving them does not mean we accept their continuous abuse, but we show them the love of God because it cannot come. We cannot humanly love them, but God's spirit and power is able to give us the grace to love our enemies. Amen. Are you ready, friends? <laughs> You see, this passage is Jesus talking in the Sermon on the Mount. I wonder if Jesus were to pontificate this sermon in our day and age. I tell you, many a church folks will get out and walk away. They'll say it's out of his senses. Because we want our little position of comfort. We want a little space. It is my space. It is, this is my tough. How dare he, she say that? But God is saying, go in the opposite spirit. Love your enemy. But before we get lost into this loving your enemies, I look at the time, and I've only preached one-tenth of my sermon. Because it will be easy to respond by saying, yeah, I love my enemies. It is easy. You might be sitting here this morning and you say, or here listening from online, and you say, yes, I really, I do love my enemies. The truth of loving your enemies, like they say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. The proof of it is when you get out of church this morning and somebody that, that, that you felt has really be, you've been held, or, or somehow there's this enmity between you and him or her. If you text them and say, forgive me. That is when the rubber hits the road. And you're taking the bold step to live what Jesus is calling us to do. Because Jesus' comment here about loving your enemies did not just come out of the blue. Bear in mind that historically Jesus was born under the Roman Empire. And being born under the Roman Empire, the Jewish community are, at, are, are suffering massive oppression from the Roman Empire. And here is this young carpenter who began his teaching. And he's saying, although you have been oppressed for all these years, although Rome is everywhere, they are tasking you, taxing you, they are doing everything impossible for you to survive. But yet I am saying, under this condition, love the Romans. Love your enemies. Jesus, when he called his disciples, he said, you will be persecuted. You will go through trials. But yet, I call you, love your enemies. Fast forward. The question you might be asking is, how could a God of justice, even in the midst of injustice, ask me to love my enemies? When we look at all through the account of Scripture, we know clearly that everything love that Jesus, all the message of love that Jesus preaches is countercultural because it is totally against what the world expects. So what is our take home? Jesus teaches us how to prevent violence by loving our enemies and seal it off at its origin by his teaching of love for your enemies. And Jesus teaches when violence uh, does break out, he teaches us how to use transforming initiatives. He shows us how to attack and overcome the structural causes of violence and evil. When we love our enemies, I tell you, it disempowers them. When you love people that are unlovable, it disempowers them because they all of a sudden realize that there is nothing that they can say or do that will harm you because you are showing the opposite. You are expressing the love that comes from the Father through you to them. And in so doing, the tendency is the Holy Spirit can use that and convict them. Jesus is teaching his disciples to model a way of reconciliation in a community. And Jesus is teaching them how to demonstrate. And I believe Jesus is teaching us as well. So what is your take home? The take home will be loving your enemy starts in the inside. 
Loving your enemies begins on the inside. That's the, yes, loving your enemies begin in the inside. It begins with you first loving yourself. It begins with you first accepting that you're human. It begins with you accepting your mortality. It begins with you of knowing that yes, I have weaknesses, but by the grace and the strength of God, I can do this. Loving your enemies, when you, be, when you love yourself enough, you will then be able to express that love to the world around you. And when you pray for your enemies, oh boy, that's about the hardest thing to do. To get on your knees and pray for somebody that really drives you up, this, up the wall. But when you begin to do that, the Holy Spirit works in you to change you, to mold you. And loving our enemies, seeing them as human beings in need of a father's love. Many a war has begun by people really making caricature of the others, dehumanizing, taking away their humanity away from them. You can go from nation after nation where there's a genocide or there's some kinds of war. It has often begun with making a caricature of taking the humanity out of them, and then you are able to do whatever you want to do with them. But Jesus is saying, love your enemies by seeing them as human beings. And lastly, we love our enemies so that we might please the God who loves us. Amen. Friends, when it comes to the real world way of love, it cannot compare to the discipleship way of love. As a church, we are called and mandated to be radical. And I wrap up with a, with, a, with a quote from Brother Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He says, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. The, disciples mo- the disciple must say to himself the same words Peter said of Christ when he denied him. I know not this man. Self-denial is never just a series of isolated acts of mortification or asceticism. It is not suicide For there is an element of self-will even in that. To deny oneself is to be aware only of Christ and no more of self. To see only him who goes before and no more the road which is too hard for us. Once more, all that self-denial can say, all that self-denial can say is he leads the way, keep close to him. Jesus is inviting us to keep close to him. God bless you. Okay, Samuel. Yes. Thanks for teaching us this morning. Here we are, everyone. Uh, It's good to be here. Hopefully you all caught all of what Samuel had to say. And like I said, kind of at the beginning of our time together, we're going to spend a few minutes here at the end of our service chatting with Samuel, asking him a few questions. Thanks for the questions some of you have thrown in the chat. We'll certainly get to those. It's not too late. If you're still thinking about what he said, processing it, throw something in the chat. I've got it open here. We can take a look mm. at it and see if it fits. But thanks so much. How'd, how'd it go? How'd it feel for you? I think it went well. Uh, yeah. Personally, you know, you never get used to doing this. <laughs> You've done it countless number of times, but yet you get there and you, you really want to be in tune with what is God, the Holy Spirit, saying. That you don't just jumble your own idea and just deliver. Yeah. But even though you plan, but yet you still are, I call it like literally still planning as you're presenting your message. <laughs> Yeah, I feel that. Been there, done that. Okay, thank you. I hope I'm not the only one. (laughs) Okay, well, we do have some questions. But before we do that, Samuel, you're a discipleship pastor, and it feels like we just need to get to know you a little bit better. Yes. So I am not, I mean, Quincy is the one that apparently has all the secrets from your time in Timmins. Oh, jeez. So we're not going to go there. Thank you. But, like, tell us, like, how did you spend your summer? Give us a sense of what the Sarpia family did through the summer this year. As a family, actually, we really didn't do, like, a whole lot together. Yeah. Uh, because there's so many moving pieces in our home. My daughter is transferring college, <clears throat> university from Sherbrooke to Ottawa. Mm-hmm. So we did the trip to go clear up her apartment out there and bring yeah. it here. And then I had friends visiting me from South Africa for 10 days. Lovely. And so we did uh, all the touristy things <laughs> again, like tourists. 
as, and we've done it before. Now, in the next two weeks, I'll be doing another tourist return again because a friend of mine from the States, ah. my, my wife's dear, dear, dear friend, she's a, she just finished her, uh, her, her degree in nurse practitioner. She, yeah. She's fully certified nurse practitioner. And I was, we played a significant part in her journey towards education. So Lovely. she's coming to visit us. So, so the uh, summer, is, even though today is the official last long weekend of the summer, I but I still have summer plans. And yeah. I went to Colorado. Oh, yes. To the Rocky Mountains. Okay. I've been to Fort Collins for National Youth Conference, mm -hmm. uh, which is with the Church of the Brethren. But I've been there, uh, like, in the last 16 years. Every four years I go there. Mm -hmm. But this year, I thought maybe, I just realized I'm, I'm aging. I won't tell you what my age is. <laughs> and I'm going to keep my mouth shut because we're colleagues. But one of us is older than the other one of us. That's all I'll it's say. It's not me. <laughs> So I went on a hike. I've been on this hike before, but I thought maybe I'm still young. So I decided to go on the other hike. <laughs> the first 180 meters from already 100 plus yeah. feet above, I took off and I realized that I'm, I was losing oxygen in my ah, head. So, so I started there, coming back, yeah. but eventually took my time and went back to hike. That's yeah. so great. So yeah. it sounds like you guys as a family are so relational. There's things you love to do. Your girls are at an age where they're heading off to different parts, starting school in various places. And what you described, I think, is a lot of our experience living in the GTA <laughs> and anywhere, really. You're mostly a tourist when people come to town. We never take advantage of the fun <laughs> things in our own areas until someone from out of town comes. So good yeah. for you yeah. for doing that. OK, I want to get to some questions based on your teaching. There are some good ones here in the chat. I just have to find them again because you guys are chatting so much. OK, Chad asks a really good question. He says this, given that Sunday morning service is largely a passive event for the majority of our attendees, what role can it play in achieving or activating discipleship? It's hard not to see it as a hindrance, but what role can the Sunday morning play in the activation? Actually, uh, the Sunday morning teaching becomes a platform. Mm -hmm. that The general concept of discipleship is introduced from the platform. And so all the other members of the meeting house that watches the Sunday morning teaching begins to live that out in the context of a home church, in the context of a small group, in the context of children's church, in the context of youth church, because we have to redefine and re-understand what discipleship is all about. Discipleship is not just about the tool that you're using. Yeah. Discipleship is that relational piece. The tool becomes an asset when you have conversation. Like our home church questions, it's a tool. Yeah. Uh, my our current book study that I'm doing with most of the home church elders on emotionally healthy discipleship, it's a tool. Yeah. And there is going to be many more tools that will be introduced, but it is the life that we do together that makes discipleship a journey. Ah, that is so good. And Samuel, I don't know you as well yet. You're still, like, we're still kind of new to one another, but if there's one thing I know to be true of you, it's you just are such an encourager around that relational connection. And I'm starting to see why, because it's at the core of discipleship. I love that, the difference between the tools we use and using it in relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay, second question here. If the call of the Great Commission is to make discipleship, what is the best way to allocate our collective resources to support it? I, it, this kind of dovetails through, still back into the first question. I, yeah. I think we need to realize, th th I think there's an urgency in realizing that we have, we already have, there's quite a lot of resources that has been allocated subliminally, silently, unintentionally, but we are. Mm -hmm. If you look at our Sunday school curriculum, our children's church curriculum, mm -hmm. it is an, the amount of resource that has been allocated, manpower, financial resource, people resource. And when you think about the number of volunteers that volunteer across all of our parish, uh, our, our regions, yeah. uh, when you think about the number of volunteers, that that is a manpower resource. Yeah. And so it's to help all of this manpower begin to switch to see, I am actually on the journey of discipleship. Mm. I'm not just a Kid Max coordinator. Kid Max coordinator is my functional role, mm -hmm. but my actual duty is a disciple maker mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and a disciple. My daughter is a volunteer in the Kid Max code in uh, Kids Church here, mm -hmm. and she volunteers and she looks up. And again, I don't want to do name dropping here, but she looks up to Haley, yeah. a children's church pastor, because she, she takes her cue from Haley. Yeah. And if, can we imagine the kind of impact? 
of that kind of a discipleship. Even though she doesn't walk directly every Sunday with Haley, mm -hmm. but any time the name Haley comes up at our dining table, <laughs> she becomes animated and alive. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's how discipleship works. Discipleship is when you do life together, yeah. your life impacts, and yeah. the impact of what you've impacted in the other person yeah. impact another person. Just kind of carry it on, right? Yeah. That's that journey piece that we've talked about a little bit. Yeah. So good, to Samuel. Okay, I have a question for you. We'll see if any more come through the chat. This is just like, because of time, we as teachers and preachers, we know this, we never get to everything that we have in our sermon notes. Hardly ever, anyways. And I have a hunch that was true of you this morning. So is there yeah. anything you didn't get to uh, in the idea of radical discipleship that you just would love to highlight for us? Yes, I didn't spend more time talking about oral culture okay. that I wish I could talk about. Talk about it now. In oral culture, which is, I now I'm back, uh, dovetailing back to uh, the First Nation community mm -hmm. where uh, culture mm -hmm. is being translated orally. And lives, everything that you learn, you learn from your mass, from your disciple or disciple, who, from your elder, who then in turn teaches you and you internalize. What happened is the implication of that is the disciple and the discipler have to work hand in hand. It's not just a transfer of knowledge. Yeah. It's a transfer of skill. It's a transfer of life. It's basically life on life. Mm -hmm. For example, when I talk about a young man that came to talk about smudging, and he keeps referring back to, my master teach me this. And I learn, I, he talked about it and I see him do it this way. Mm -hmm. And I have, over the years, improved on what I have learned from him by my own little wisdom that I've gained. And so discipleship is like that. Yeah. And so I didn't spend much time talking about that. I wish I could really <laughs> hone in that when you talk about discipleship, oh boy, it means sacrificial. You know, Jesus hung out with his 12. He was with them. They say the Bibles give us an account that Jesus had to sneak out super early in the morning to go and be alone. So basically, discipleship is we're, we're in this together. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So good. Okay, want to talk a little bit about like why do you think people get scared when they hear the word discipleship or when they sit down and realize, oh boy, today's teaching is on discipleship? What do you think are some of the like apprehensions or hindrances or barriers that people have to embracing a <clears throat> life of discipleship. I, and I'll grant it to our forerunners. And when I mean our forerunners, uh, people, again, not just the meeting house forerunners in mm -hmm. Christendom, people have taught about discipleship as this bunch of tools. Let's get one book on discipleship. If yeah. you go to the bookstore to buy a book on discipleship, heck no. <laughs> There is a book about everything, Seven Steps to Discipleship. You yeah. read this book, after some, reading Seven Steps to Discipleship, you realize, ah, oh, my life has not changed. Right. And the reason is because people assume discipleship from a very cognitive point of view. Mm -hmm. They miss the relational piece. Mm -hmm. And so they, they see the tool. Yeah. The tool is almost like the, <coughs> the cat before the horse. Yep. And so let us reimagine let us reorient ourselves about the concept of discipleship. Instead of looking at the tools, mm -hmm. we look at the relationship, and then we go, what tool can enhance my relationship with this group that we are on a journey with? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the tools that I really want to throw in the mix for all of our home church elders is, think about running a, a long, a, alongside your home church question, the one thing, another tool that I really want you to think about, Ronnie, is Anabaptist Essentials. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I am talking about this is our core as a church, we are built on an Anabaptist theology and understanding. Yeah. And if our ecclesiology and our church and theology is built on Anabaptism, I really want us to hone that because then we can do life. Even when Amen. we disagree, yes. we will still do life together. So good. And that's like a convenient plug for the next teaching series. Oh, which is us kind of talking a bit then about... And I'll ask you for money for that. You have to pay me. <laughs> we probably promised we didn't even plan that. But as Quincy said at the beginning of the teaching, our next teaching series starting next week is kind of because we're Anabaptists, because that is our heritage, because that is our theology, we want to recenter on Jesus and understand what it means to live out of and be a church that lives within an Anabaptist theology. So you're going to want to continue to track with the teaching. So thanks for that, like, amazing plug in and, in, you know, off the top of your head there. Probably that's what I get paid for. <laughs> Okay, uh, second last question. Okay. I think. What is one step that we can take towards growing 
as a disciple of Jesus. Like for everyone listening, and I recognize when we talk about a journey, this is the really cool thing, is like we're not all at the same spot on the journey, right? Mm -hmm. But the idea of a next step, we can all take a step. Yeah. It's not a race to see who gets to the finish line first, mm -hmm. but it's like, so what, what would you say to people when we talk discipleship? What is a next step we can take towards growing? Honestly, finding an unramp that is easy for you. And mm -hmm. when I mean easy, I, now I'm, I'm, it sounds like I'm shooting myself in the foot because discipleship is costly. You, yeah, I heard that. But yeah. what is easy yeah. is what am I able to do by God's grace that will allow me that I don't start too hard and fail and become a failure. Right. Because the enemy takes advantage of, you have to start the bar yes. so high. Oh, and so, so when good. you're not able to attend mm -hmm. that bar, you walk around with guilt mm -hmm. that I have failed, and so you never have the opportunity to start. Find an on-ramp that is super easy. Mm -hmm. I've discovered that when you, for example, me, if I have, uh, I remember a time that I really want to get into studying uh, stuff about neurosciences and the brain and how conflict and the brain functions. Mm -hmm. I dove, drove, uh, like, like, like jumped full into on. full yeah. on looking at neurosciences and the implication of the brain. I realized that that was overwhelming. I gave up. Yes. And then my mentor told me that, how did you, you're trying to understand conflict. Why don't you just understand how to make up of the brain? Simple. Just, and he uses the illustration, take up your fist. Mm -hmm. That's just the way your brain is, fun is formed. Yeah. The stem and all of that. And so by the time I started looking at all the different functions of the, the stem, the, the emotional social regulator, the neofrontal cortex and all of that, I realized that actually if I can buy it one piece at a time, it will help me to understand mm -hmm. how people can help prevent conflict in their own lives mm. using their own brain cool. understanding. Yeah. So start easy, yeah. find an easy on-ramp and from there on, the next step and the next step and the and next step, yeah. Under the leading of the Holy Spirit, it yeah. becomes an impetus behind you. So good, Samuel. Okay, there is actually one more ch question in the chat. I just am noticing it now. So let's check it out and see uh, what we think here. In the church lar at large, we are we evolving from one-on-one -on -one discipleship to triad and small group and mutual discipleship making? Is this a little different from mentoring? And is mentoring more related to leadership development? So Stephen's just asking the sense of like, are we moving from the one-on-one -on -one to more of like a triad? He refers to a book. Greg Ogden wrote a book called, I forget what it was called now. I read it. Transformation of yep, the Yep, that's the one. And there's like that sense of the triad discipleship in group yeah. mentality. Just comment on the question. Speak around the question yeah. at hand. Um, when, um, one-on-one -on -one mentoring, there's a room for one-on-one -on -one mentoring and it can be a discipleship. Uh, mm -hmm. conversation um, and I actually recently just have been introducing one-on-one -on -one mentoring to uh, one of our uh, having a conversation with Jordan mm -hmm. uh, from Burlington yeah, one of our pastors. actually yeah. last week this, no this week on Monday about one-on-one um, uh, -on -one mentoring because one-on-one -on -one mentoring uh, you and I, I have a tool that goes with one-on-one -on -one mentoring mm -hmm. because it's intentional doing life together so I am not against the one-on-one -on -one or the triad is just like what are some ways that you I we are collectively growing as followers of Jesus mm. and who are we bringing along this journey my philosophy for ministry is when I am coaching you as a one-on-one, -on -one, the onus is for you to begin a one-on-one -on -one yes, with somebody. Someone else, yeah. And totally. that person start a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. And then we still have that shared community. We are other Baptists. We can't do live on one-on-one. -on -one. We have yeah. to do it in community where we're accountable to each other. And that's the piece about other Baptists that I really love. Yeah. Because uh, if we're in community, it makes me free that I know I'm not alone on this journey yeah. and I yeah. can fall back on my community to help me when this journey gets a little bit tough. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Thank you, Samuel. Guys, thanks for engaging and sending some questions in the chat. Uh, okay. That's just so fantastic. This is why we do it. This is how we do that sense of like, we may not be in the room together, but we're still growing together, learning together. And so you engaging in this way is really fantastic. And for those of you that I know are probably going to catch this throughout the week, uh, sorry, this was that <laughs> you couldn't engage, but there's always ways to send questions in and engage. It's never just about like right now, uh, you know, in the moment, but there is something special about being live in the live stream together. So thanks for teaching this morning. Thanks for engaging in this way. As we wrap up, we always end this way, but I think it conveniently fits. We always want to invite you into what might be next for you as you think about the meeting house as your home, as your community. 
And one of those ways is home church. You've heard Samuel refer to it. You hear us talk about it all the time because this is a part of who we are because we actually believe in the relational one-on-one small group community connection. It's when we're in relationship together that these tools that Samuel's talking about come alive, Hmm. that we ask questions of each other, that we might read books together. But when we're getting to know one another as brothers and sisters in the church, This is the space where we're going to find that we grow and become transformed. And so you see the link there where you can connect into home church. If you're not already, this is that time. We're in the new rhythm of the fall. Find a home church. We have so many online. We have so many that are meeting in person in the localities where our regions are. This would be one of those steps that we would encourage you all to take. Do you want to say anything about home church? I realize I'm doing all the talking here. No, this is good. I, you know, I don't want you to feel like when we say find a home church, find a home church, it's like we're beating you on the head. But I tell you, The testimonies that I have heard from home church and how through their home church they've navigated, it has helped them to have community, to navigate the current challenge, to be able to, to be able to help them in this polarized world that at least is a family that they can always go to. And that is why we are inviting you to be a part of a home church. Mm -hmm. It's not because, oh, home church is, it's everything, but home church is where the relational peace happened. God bless you as you find a home church that fits you. Absolutely. And thanks for hanging out with us this morning. Have a fantastic week. Enjoy these last few days of the long weekend. Take care.